Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening. Greetings to our dear audience from around the world. Welcome to this virtual side event of the 76th UN General Assembly. My name is Anuradha Kanal. I'm the Regional Director for Southeast Asia Programs at the Global Health Advocacy Incubator. I am humbled to be moderating this important conversation on budget advocacy on behalf of my organization. The global spread of COVID-19 is a vivid reminder for countries to invest urgently and adequately in health, health policies and programs, their financing and the overall strengthening of health systems. Unfortunately, past crises, including SARS, H1N1, Ebola, they've all shown how difficult it is to maintain political will and investments for health once emergencies end. Even without a global pandemic, one of the most pressing questions in public health has long been, how do we secure funding? And then how do we sustain that funding for life-saving programs? There is no better time to explore all these questions. And today we have three things lined up to dig deeper. First, I'm very excited to share a new budget advocacy framework developed by my organization to guide public health advocates in both civil society and government to advocate for increased and sustained budget for epidemic preparedness. Second, you will hear from global leaders on how budget advocacy led to domestic financing for maternal and reproductive health programs and drowning prevention programs in Tanzania and in Vietnam. And last but not the least, we have an expert panel that will go into depth into a recent success story in Nigeria where advocacy led to an increased budget for epidemic preparedness. It is very important for me to highlight that our speakers come from different vantage points. They, they however, share a common mission. Life-saving health programs need to be financially sustained and that budget advocacy can get us there. Before we begin, I would like to mention a few quick logistics. This event is being recorded. It is also being simultaneously interpreted in French and Spanish. Please use the globe icon on the bottom right hand corner of the screen to select your preferred language. We also encourage you to follow along and join the conversation in social media using hashtags UNGA76, that's hashtag UNGA76, and hashtag Prevent Epidemics Budget Framework. Most importantly, we really want to hear from you. Please share your comments in the chat using the Q&A feature for questions. And with that, we would like to open today's event with a short video. What if every country were able to prevent, find, and stop disease outbreaks before they got out of control? COVID-19 is the latest devastating consequence of our failure to prepare for epidemics. But it doesn't have to be that way. Countries that invest in health security see returns of nine to one. But unfortunately, the political will to invest in health systems often ends once the crisis does, until the next costly disease outbreak. The only way to change that is for citizens to demand that their governments prioritize health budgets and keep them accountable for committing and spending funds wisely within their own countries. That's why budget advocacy is crucial and must be locally led and sustained. We've developed a framework to help guide civil society organizations as they push for increased health budgets, leading to programs that reduce death and disease. Our framework is based on successful campaigns in India, Nigeria, Senegal, Tanzania, and Vietnam, and was made to support advocates in all countries. The advocates we support won't stop fighting for a healthier, safer world, and neither will we. Download our budget advocacy framework at advocacyincubator.org. 
And now on to the budget advocacy framework. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you our executive vice president of global programs, Yolanda Richardson. Yolanda is a recognized expert on gender and international development, global health, US philanthropy and corporate social responsibility. We at the Advocacy Incubator benefit from her leadership, her decades of international advocacy experience and her thoughtful approach to budget advocacy and sustainability. Yolanda will share with us the budget advocacy framework, how it came into being and how we're using it across our different programs. Yolanda, welcome, the floor is yours. We are excited to share this new budget advocacy framework with you. If the global COVID epidemic has taught us anything, it has shown us the importance of strategic investments in health and health infrastructure. Every government, wealthy or not, has seen the devastating impact in terms of lives lost and domestic economies shattered. In order to ensure that investments in strong, sustainable health systems with the capacity to respond to new and existing threats are there, we need sustained funding. Local and national advocacy is how countries can keep attention on the need for strong public health budgets. This framework is meant to help civil society advocates, policymakers with a step-by-step -step process for getting there. As the video mentioned, the Global Health Advocacy Incubator supports civil society organizations that advocate for public health policies that reduce death and disease. We've done that in diverse countries and political systems. Our budget advocacy framework has been informed by our strategic approach to policy change. It is rooted in our support for successful locally led campaigns. This framework is based on our close work with government and civil society leaders in, in Nigeria and Senegal to make the case for epidemic preparedness. The goal of the Incubators Preventing Epidemics Program is to end the cycle of outbreak panic followed by policy and funding complacency. In Nigeria and Senegal, we supported civil society and key government agencies to build political awareness and support for government investments in epidemic preparedness. This framework includes four steps. Step one is planning the budget campaign. We support local partners to plan a comprehensive political strategy by conducting a political and legal landscape analysis, mapping key stakeholders, and building a strong, locally grounded case for increased investments in epidemic preparedness. In our experience, it is important to build both a strong public health case as well as an economic case. Step two is conducting the campaign. We worked with local technical experts to build a multi-sector coalition to meet and engage with policymakers and generate media coverage. Our local partners work to highlight and amplify diverse voices to bring urgency for the need for increased funding. Step three is strengthening accountability. Once resources are allocated, it is critical to track budget allocations and spending to identify bottlenecks and getting the resources where they are most needed. Budget transparency is key. Our partners stay on the job to ensure effective use of often hard fought for resources. Step four is promoting budget sustainability. This involves conducting program impact evaluations and assessing budget needs for the next budget cycle to sustain and increase the investment in the medium and the long term. This framework was not only built based upon our successful budget advocacy campaigns in Nigeria and Senegal, but also campaigns for public financing for hypertension services in India, maternal and reproductive health in Tanzania, and drowning prevention programs in Vietnam. Now we'll hear from our partners and colleagues about some of these projects, but we invite anyone watching to download the framework for free at www advocacyincubator.org. Thank you. First, I would like to discuss uh, the maternal reproductive health uh, program in Tanzania itself. Um, this program uh, brought better health care to village level by upgrading and equipping its facilities and training non-physician 
clinicians. Uh, this approach increased women's access to images of social care, uh, reproductive health services, and family planning. And we also strengthened the referral systems, improved the women's experience when uh, giving birth through birth companionship, uh, and increased demand for good quality services through multimedia communication campaigns and by partnering with community health workers. Uh, but all those improvements uh, uh, required financing, and we are thankful that uh, uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies and Foundation HB Group, uh, uh, Foundation HNB Group uh, gave us the resources to, uh, to do the, the program. Uh, but these improvements, uh, after the program was coming to the end, needed to be sustained. And how do we going to sustain them? Uh, in coming, uh, thinking about how the program is going to be sustained, uh, we needed the government to know that we as health workers, uh, community members, uh, wanted the program to continue. Uh, and uh, we needed to show its impact and show that we support it and we would, hold, like, would like to hold the leaders accountable to ensure that the quality of services that have been attained uh, are, are, are maintained. Uh, so we, we thought it's important for the government to hear from their constituents. And uh, for that, we became advocates. And um, uh, we are thankful that Bloomberg Philanthropies uh, brought a global health advocacy incubator as a sustainability partner to help us uh, in advocacy with the government. And the Global Health Advocacy Incubator came in to help us to plan how we can, uh, we can uh, be advocates and ensure that the program becomes sustainable. And they helped us to provide uh, dedicated training and ongoing support to local implementers, uh, the doctors and nurses, nurses, to tell their stories to legislators and the media. And this contributed to one of the program's greatest uh, achievements uh, that the government allocated to Kigoma the highest number of health staff that were allocated in the country in 2018. And thanks to our advocacy, the regional commissioner uh, for Kigoma promised to sustain the activities and the high level quality services they provide into the future. And now we have continued following up, uh, the, the promise being fulfilled. And so far, uh, one year on, the, the uh, activities that we've been implementing these facilities are continuing uh, to be implemented and the more women lives are continuing uh, to be saved. In Vietnam, every year, more than 2,000 children die of drownings. This is a leading cause of death among children under 15 years old. Since 2018, the Bloomberg Philanthropies announced its partnership with the government of Vietnam to implement the five-year program for prevent child drowning. The Global Health Advocacy Incubator is the implementing agency to support the leading Ministry of Labor, World Values and Social Affairs to best implement and sustain the evidence-based intervention that focus on survival stream and water safety education for the children at the age of 6 to 15 years old. Over the last time, Vietnamese government recognized child drowning prevention as a primary solution to reduce their child injuries. With the primary results of our demonstration program in reducing drowning case among the eight provinces with a high burden, and now the government decided to expand to cover 12 provinces with a diversified geographic features. Significantly, Survivor Stream is selected to be the major solution for their 10 year national program on child injury prevention that passed by the Prime Minister since July of this year. Among the testing province, Đồng Tháp is a rural south region, in the first province to release their five-year plan for drowning prevention. They target the confirmed financing sustainability. They cover nearly 500,000 US dollars for the next five years that is six times higher than the first year program started. This meaningful decision will be inspiration for other provinces and how the program outside could be sustained with a long-term impact. Thank you so much to Yolanda, Dr. Nguke Mwakatundu, and Duan Tu Huen for sharing your experiences and insights on how to successfully advocate for public health budgets. Having had the opportunity to be a part of these projects, 
in Tanzania and Vietnam, I cannot emphasize how um, incredible these programs have been in saving lives of mothers and newborns and of children under 15 in Vietnam and how, how much of a, how integrated they are to the fabric of the community. Um, the work done by Dr. Nguke Mokatundu and his team and by Duan Huen and her partners have ensured that the communities continue to receive the services that are uh, critical uh, for, for the health and well being of, of the people of Vietnam and Tanzania. So, congratulations to Dr. Nguke and Huen and to our colleagues in Vietnam and Tanzania. This has been no easy feat, and the commitments and funding you describe are a tremendous win for public health. And now on to our panel, who will share with us recent successes in Nigeria, where advocacy led to increased commitments for epidemic preparedness. It is my honor to introduce to you our distinguished panelists. We have with us Dr. Priscilla Ebekwe, Director of Special Duties at the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, leading Nigeria's effort to prepare for, detect, and respond to infectious disease outbreaks and public health emergencies. Dr. Ibekwe has over 25 years of experience in health system strengthening and is currently engaging with the private and public sector to support the COVID-19 response in her country. Dr. Ibekwe, thank you for giving us your time today and for keeping Nigerians safe from the pandemic of today and the future. I would also like to welcome Dr. Gafar Alaode, who serves on the board of the Legislative Initiative for Sustainable Development, a nonprofit organization committed to improving the lives of Nigerians. Dr. Gafar leads Listel's efforts to increase government investment in epidemic preparedness at the national, local, and state levels. Thank you, Dr. Gafar, for your incredible work and for joining us today. And last but not the least, our third panelist is my colleague, Anne Donelsky. Anne brings over 15 years of experience in domestic and international health policy, policy and advocacy with a focus on infectious disease and increasing access to healthcare coverage. Anne advises epidemic preparedness advocates in Nigeria and Ghana, as well as cardiovascular health advocates in Nigeria. Welcome to the panel, Anne. So to, to start us off, and I would like to go to you first for your opening remarks on the program and how the framework that we just talked about fits in with the Nigeria experience. The floor is yours. Thank you, Anu, and good morning and good afternoon. I am pleased to join the panel today to discuss GHAI's Prevent Epidemics Program, a program in partnership with Resolve to Save Lives and the budget advocacy framework that guides our work. I am deeply honored to be joined by Dr. Priscilla Ebekwe and Dr. Gafar Alawade, who will share their experience with budget advocacy, experience based on strategies that may be replicated in other countries to increase and sustain investments in epidemic preparedness. The focus of my comments will be will be um, will follow a brief overview of GHAI's Prevent Epidemics program. And discuss, and I will discuss briefly how GHAI's budget advocacy framework guides our work in Nigeria. May I have the first slide, please? The primary objective of the Prevent Epidemics program is to increase and sustain national investments in epidemic preparedness through locally led advocacy campaigns. GHI's program in Nigeria started in 2018 and has expanded to state level work in Kano and Lagos. At the national level, advocacy by government and civil society has contributed to a more than doubling of the budget to the Nigeria CDC over the past two years with funding now provided directly to NCDC through the annual budget process and a percentage share of the basic healthcare provision fund. In Nigeria's Kano state, advocacy by our partners has helped to establish a new budget line dedicated to epidemic preparedness and response, and EPR spending is allocated in each of the 44 local government areas for FY 2021. Next slide, please. GHI's advocacy in Nigeria informed the development of the budget advocacy framework. The four-step approach built around the budget cycle was adapted to country context. 
For step one, campaign planning, GHI's partners identified the policy objective, conducted landscape analyses, mapped key players in government, and mapped key players in government to assess political will, civil society and media capacity, and awareness of epidemic preparedness as a national priority. The research identified the need to support increased funding because although important steps have been taken by the Nigerian government to improve health security, funding to NCDC remained too low. To implement the campaign, step two on the wheel, GHI identified three civil society partners, Nigeria Health Watch, the Legislative Network for Sustainable Development, and Budget, to coordinate activities to increase awareness and build support for increased investments in epidemic preparedness. Our partners also collaborated with NCDC and budget staff to help make the case for increased investments and to identify and remove funding barriers. For step three, budget accountability, our partners advocated for the release of allocated funds and have developed the health security accountability framework to track budget allocations and the spending of resources. For step four, budget sustainability, our partners assess the use of resources, spending shortfalls and remaining gaps to inform budget advocacy into the next budget cycle where we reassess the landscape, update mapping and refine the policy objective to support funding sustainability. That concludes my PE summary and I look forward to answering any questions during the question and answer segment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anne, for framing up the conversation so nicely and for these insights. Um, there are certainly many lessons learned uh, from the framework that other programs and countries can benefit from. Um, and moving on to Dr. Ibekwe. Dr. Ibekwe, I want to welcome you again um, and, and welcome your introductory remarks and to tell us why the recent Nigerian federal budget commitments are important and how did Nigeria CDC lead the way in securing these commitments. The floor is yours, Dr. Ibekwe. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share uh, Nigeria's experience in increasing funding for health security. I'll start by saying that global, uh, global health security is everybody's business, and Nigeria takes it very seriously. Given the cycle of um, epidemics, some of which are endemic in Nigeria, uh, of infectious diseases. So currently we have a cholera outbreak that has affected uh, 25 states out of the 20, uh, 36 states of the Federation. Uh, 69,000 people have been affected with over 2,300 deaths. So it, it's very important that uh, Nigeria commits to increasing its funding and to do something in this area. With the global health security, we are strong as our weakest link. And Nigeria's federal government commitment is vital uh, for ensuring our national health security and funding is a part of its commitment in showing that it's committed to the health of Nigerians. So NCDC has played a very big role in this, in the sense that the Nigeria Center for Disease Control um, is a young organization, a parasitical of the federal government of Nigeria that was formed in 20, 2011 but didn't have a legal mandate. So it made sense that the chief executives, both chief executives worked hard, the first and the second, worked very hard to uh, get us there, to have us uh, have a legal, and uh, make us a legal entity. And we had the NCDC Act in 2018, which allows us, you know, as a legal entity, we're better positioned to receive funding from all sources, government, private sector, and partners. With this clear mandate to protect the uh, uh, health of Nigerians, we developed a strategic five-year strategic plan. And we have also shown our commitment to the international health regulations and use global instruments like the uh, joint um, external ex uh, evaluation tools to see where we are. And uh, we did it in 2017, 2019. And there has been an improvement from 39% to 46%. I'm saying this because it's important to use the global instruments, use this to develop national, we develop the National Health Action uh, Plan for Health Security. And we have also demonstrated improvements uh, with the investments made. 
We've continued to engage at the national and sub-national level uh, with the parliamentarians, just like uh, has been mentioned. Uh, we've also uh, engaged with the develop, uh, at the time they uh, were developing the National Risk Register led by the Office of the National Security Advisor of the nation. Uh, we were at the table and we put pandemic on the National Re Register. And so it's not surprising that when the you know, COVID came, uh, we were confronted with COVID, there was funding to support us in this area. We continue to engage with the Federal Ministry of uh, Finance, Budgets and Planning in all its development plans, whether short term, long term, just to be sure that health security is included in this, in all its operational plans and that of the, um, the Federal Ministry of Health. To say that uh, we made a lot of advocacy, a lot of uh, uh, advocacy for the basic healthcare provision fund, a commitment from Nigeria towards the universal uh, healthcare coverage and ensure that NCDC was included as the fourth arm uh, uh, that is not only covering the primary health care, health insurance, emergency uh, me me medical treatment, but that there was funding for public health emergencies. And as we got our allocation, we used those funds to develop at least five public health EOCs. Uh, that's the emergency operation center, treatment centers. And these were used during the COVID response. The point made here is to note that when you receive your funding, you ensure that these funds are used and used to make a real difference. Um, and I will say that we continue to engage with the private sector. We could see how the CAC COVID organized private sector, you know, raised a lot of funds and support for NCDC. And we have very clear cut um, SOPs and, you know, we write our reports. It's accountability is also important. So, in my role as the head of partnership, funding, planning, strategy, monitoring, and evaluation, I'm always at the, the my team is always at the, at the center of this discourse to ensure that, that uh, health security is on the agenda. And we'll continue to work to ensure that we have sizable, sustainable, um, and substantial funding for health security. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Priscilla Ibekwe. Um, what a wonderful, what a wonderful testament. I want to reiterate what you what you said. Um, global health security is everybody's business, and Nigeria takes it very seriously. I think this is. I we hope that this will be how the rest of the world perceives this too, especially after the pandemic that we're in. Um, thank you very much for your introductory remarks. Um, we want to congratulate Nigeria CDC. What a tremendous achievement and what a comprehensive take on epidemic preparedness for Nigeria. Congratulations to everyone involved. With that, I would like to go to Dr. Gaffar um, to hear a civil society perspective on um, the recent uh, wins in Nigeria. Dr. Gaffar, do you consider these budget commitments a win for public health? Um, and if so, why? And what role did your organization play in making this possible? Over to you, Dr. Gaffar. Okay, thank you very much, um, Adu, and thanks uh, uh, to the, I would like to start by thanking the Global Health Advocacy Incubator for the opportunity provided to uh, Lisa to provide the budget um, advocacy. Um, Answering the question whether we are excited um, about the budget commitment, I think we are excited for a number of reasons. I will highlight um, a couple of them. Um, to start with, um, we know very well that um, public financing is very, very central in, in terms of uh, making progress on universal health coverage and universal health security as well. However, uh, the funding landscape in Nigeria, the public financing uh, landscape for, for health is suboptimal. 
and at all level at the federal at the state at the local government level government are spending on health uh, is suboptimal uh you know as a case in point nigerian government spend less than one percent of our gross domestic product gdp uh, on health which is a far cry from the recommended benchmark of a five percent for countries that are making very good progress on um, health security so uh, if we are able to do budget advocacy and it is stimulating uh, government financing uh for for health for epidemic planning and response I think we're excited about that. Another reason why we're excited about this commitment is that um, if you look at um, uh, the, the financing landscape for public health uh, generally, uh, usually the countries tend to see uh, financing for public health as a domain of um, uh, external financing, domain of donor, domain of uh, uh, external uh, partner. So changing the endemic notion that the financing for public uh, public health uh, is a responsibility of government as well. Changing the mindset uh, is, is a very, very important accomplishment. So we are, we are committed, uh, we, are, we, are, we are excited about that as well. And, and lastly, uh, if you look at the health indices um, uh, in, the, in the country, it's, uh, uh, you know, so, 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 so unfortunate in terms of, um, uh, you know, health indices. Uh, which is attributable to uh, poor, for poor funding. So uh, getting the commitment from government uh, in terms of improve our, our government funding uh, for health and health security, we are very, very uh, excited. We are, we are of the opinion that the lessons learned in stimulating domestic financing uh, for uh, health security could be applied to stimulating uh, domestic financing uh, for health uh, uh, largely. So in terms of what we did, um, as, as a project, as a civil society uh, organization, uh, with funding from Global Health Advocacy Incubator and from um, our technical support as well, uh, we set out to um, sensitize and engage key stakeholders and put in place or strengthen um, the, the legal, institutional uh, policy and accountability framework uh, for for um, HPR uh, financing. And uh, what do I mean by this? Uh, in terms of uh, sensitization. Our approach was to uh, sensitize wide array of uh, stakeholders from the policymaker, from lawmakers, uh, to civil society, and, um, and, and, and work with other grantees as well to sensitize about the importance of investing in the epidemic preparedness and, and response, and uh, to the extent that uh, we're able to raise the sense of urgency uh, for improved uh, investment. And, and secondly, we contributed uh, very well to strengthen the institutional framework uh, for um, budget advocacy for um, epidemic preparedness and, and response, especially uh, working with a number of uh, non-state actors, especially the civil society uh, organization, a number of uh, existing coalition work with a number of existing coalition as well, and, and work with uh, other, uh, other grantees to uh, form very, very strong coalition for epidemic preparedness and, and response, which are very, very vital in terms of our, our successful advocacy. Next, uh, we work in the area of uh, strengthening the financial framework for epidemic preparedness and, and response. And this we did by ad, um, identifying what are the issues? Uh, do we have a budget line for epidemic preparedness and response? Do we have adequate allocation? Is the funds being released? If the fund is released, uh, what is it being used for? So that uh, along the line of the public financial management for EPR, we're trying to uh, identify what the gaps. And again, we try as much as possible uh, to strengthen the policy and legal framework uh, for epidemic preparedness uh, 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 and response, especially at the sub-national level where we supported states to, um, to domesticate uh, the existing policy and legal framework for EPR. Like uh, Dr. Ibeko said earlier on, the NCDC takes the lead uh, in setting the policy and, legal, uh, policy and legal framework for EPR. As of national level, we just supported them to uh, domesticate this policy so that it suits their, their con contest as much as possible. Then we work in area of um, uh, strengthening the uh, accountability framework because uh, without accountability, we would not be able to get value for the money. So uh, we, we work with the stakeholders at national and state level to develop a very, very robust uh, accountability framework, which identify what are the critical 
um, indicators to track when it comes to uh, epidemic preparedness, uh, financing, and policy? And then what is our benchmark? Uh, what is the baseline? But more importantly, what are the accountability action that we actually need to be able to make the difference? So we identify the roles uh, for the policymakers, identify the role for lawmakers, identify the role for civil society uh, and the media so that uh, everybody is very clear in terms of the rules of our uh, different actors uh, with regards to uh, strengthening the, 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 the framework for um, epidemic preparedness and, and response. So in terms of what, what we did, I think that's an overview of what we did and why we are excited about the budget commitment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gafar. Um, you know, you've highlighted that if we are to have epidemic preparedness prioritized long term, and if domestic investments beyond immediate crisis are going to happen, it requires sustained advocacy efforts. And it requires for organizations like yours, Lisdell, and leaders like Dr. Priscilla in government to be able to, to make this happen. Uh, thank you for walking us through um, sort of the various elements of the advocacy campaign. Um, and, and tying it all together in how um, you obtained budget commitment, commitments in Nigeria. It was all um, extremely um, helpful. So I will go back to Dr. Ibekwe. Um, Dr. Ibekwe, if you could talk about some of the challenges Nigeria faced when making commitments to invest in epidemic preparedness, um, can you outline those? And, and can you also outline how you overcame them? Dr. Ibekwe, there seems to be a technical issue at your end. Uh, maybe I can come back to you. Um, and, and maybe I can go back to Dr. Gaffar for, for a little bit to, to expand on what budget advocacy has looked like at the federal, state, and local levels in Nigeria and where you have been most successful. Dr. Gaffar, if you don't mind. Oh, okay, thank you very much once more, um, Anu. Uh, so, you know, you know, in order to be able to uh, strengthen the uh, the four frameworks that I mentioned in terms of uh, uh, policy, legal, institutional accountability framework for health security, uh, it was um, necessary to do uh, a, a number of things. One, it was um, necessary to understand the entire landscape uh, because um, we needed to understand the problems. What are the gaps in terms of uh, uh, policy and, uh, and, uh, and financing for uh, security. So, what are the challenges? What are the opportunities? Uh, you know, what what is what what's who are the actors and institutions that have roles to play uh, in, in in this area? So, we did a, um, uh, um, analysis, a landscape analysis, which included um, uh, political mapping to be able to understand have a, a holistic picture of uh, what are the problems, what are the opportunities, and what are the challenges. Uh, which actually helped us uh, uh, very, very well. And, and then another thing we, we did um, uh, that the policy advocacy involved is actually involved uh, building uh, a number of things, which includes um, uh, building um, relationships, building trust, building coalition, and, uh, and building capacity uh, as, as well. And um, uh, this helped us uh, uh, to, to, to build a very, very strong force that will help us uh, to advocate um, uh, very, very well. So with this understanding and the um, relationship that we've um, uh, built, um, that help us in terms of uh, planning. And when I say planning, it helps us to really uh, identify what are the specific, um, what are the specific priorities uh, for at the national level, at the state level. Take for instance, uh, in Kano State, when we got to Kano State, uh, we discovered that one of the priorities in Kano was uh, to create a budget line for epidemic preparedness and response because there was there was no uh, a budget line. And uh, looking at the public financial management system, without a budget line, you cannot allocate and you cannot release uh, uh, the money. And then part of the planning was that uh, to be able to uh, have a clear uh, roadmap, clear policy framework for epidemic preparedness and response. So we identified that as a priority as well uh, in, in Kano State. And then uh, we 
to have a clear plan of action for advocacy, which we at, at both national level and state level, we identify uh, those as, 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 as a priority in terms of uh, the need to have a, a advocacy plan, uh, the need to have a budget, um, improved budget allocation, you need to have a clear policy framework for epidemic preparedness and, and response at the national level. Of, of course, the, there was a budget line uh, for NCDC, but at the same time, it was necessary to have uh, uh, improved allocation and release of funds as well. And don't forget that, uh, like uh, Dr. Priscilla said earlier on, when it comes to epidemic, epidemic virus and response, it's not only the, although uh, NCDC is the coordinating body at the national level, but there are quite a number of agencies as well. And it was necessary to look at the budget uh, uh, allocation for all those um, other organizations as well. Uh, we dis discovered that, uh, you know, allocation to them uh, was sub uh, sub optimal uh, uh, as well. So the next thing uh, was to implement based on the priorities uh, that we've already identified and using the existing uh, coalition with the civil society and then other grantees. Don't forget that we work with um, the, the, uh, the uh, Nigeria Health Watch, which uh, actually leads the uh, media advocacy. And we work with a, a very strong organization called Abogit that was uh, responsible for mining the data and making the data available for our own uh, accountability as well. So we, we swung into action in terms of um, doing the advocacy, being guided by the advocacy plan that we've done and pursuing the key priorities uh, that we, we've already uh, identified. And then um, for us to uh, gauge performance, uh, we, we put in place a very, very robust accountability uh, a framework where, like I said earlier on, we're tracking key indicators and uh, to look at uh, uh, what progress are we making if the funds are allocated, are, being, are they being released, being used for uh, intended purposes. So in terms of um, career of success, uh, like highlighted by Anne earlier on, at the subnational level, uh, was successful in creating budget line for epidemic preparedness and response uh, with allocation of 300 million and um, with um, uh, consistent advocacy and engagement uh, the executive governor of Kano states has actually approved a significant proportion of the allocated amount. And then, uh, I know, like I said, we have an adapted uh, legal framework. And then at the national level, like Anne said earlier on, that translated to uh, like 76% increase in uh, allocation uh, to NCDC and other uh, achievements as well. Uh, I, I would like to pause uh, uh, here for now. Dr. Kafar, thank you so much. Uh, there is a lot to unpack there. You know, you talked about um, prioritization, understanding local and national priorities. You talked about having a clear roadmap, bringing along coalitions, um, advocates and different organizations together on a shared vision, and then being able to campaign, being able to maintain accountability um, and monitoring progress. All of these are excellent um, suggestions and examples of things that you've done that may be applicable to other countries. And I thank you for sharing um, your perspectives and insights um, from, from your campaign there. Um, if I may, I would like to go back to Dr. Ibekwe. Um, Dr. Ibekwe, is your audio okay? Yes, it is. Okay. Can you me <laughs> let, me, let me come to you with a question. It is a two-part question. What were some of the challenges that Nigeria faced when making commitments to invest in epidemic? And then the second part of my question is, why do you think Nigeria has been successful in investing in epidemic preparedness? So um, I would say that some of the challenges we faced was that initial lack of the statutory mandate, the mandate to do the work. Uh, so uh, apart from that, there were also gaps in information on Nigeria's preparedness. And the use of the uh, JEE, that is the Joint um, uh, External Evaluation Tool, brought to fore what your gaps are. And that, you know, and then it, there was also a lack of a comprehensive plan to address health security. There are more than 17 thematic areas covering, uh, covering even the, um, uh, both the health sector, the agri sector, and the animal sectors. So it was important that understanding these challenges led to this, um, uh, the need for collaboration, both at the national level and at the local level. And we made progress in developing these 
these instruments, developing a comprehensive plan, making sure we were a legal organization that could you know, receive funding. And so we continued advocacy, both at the national level and sub-national, speaking to the state governors, wanting state governors, because you, when you strengthen the state health security, you actually say strengthen the community. These people live in communities. They are governed by state governors, right? So what we want, we continue to, um, you know, do this advocacy uh, to uh, advocacy at all levels, not only for the federal government, but to have the same effect, uh, both at the state government and the local government level. And it's work that we'll continue to do until we have this sustained, um, uh, sizable, uh, substantial uh, allocation for health security. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Priscilla. I, I, I would really want to highlight, you know, what, what you said struck to me. What we're really looking at is impact at the local community level and how we get there. You know, it may be through state budgets, national budget, local budgets, but the impact of these financing of these investments in public health really are at the community level and um, among, among citizens. Um, so congratulations again, and the impact on health that these budgets will have um, will you know, definitely be substantial and will be for, for the long term. Um, from that, I would like to turn to Anne um, and thanks for presenting the framework earlier. And you also have a unique role to play in the budget advocacy space, looking at different countries and how they are um, you know, um, investing in epidemic preparedness, et cetera. What lessons have we learned from the Nigeria experience on budget advocacy that could maybe be helpful to other countries? Please, Anne. Well, one of the most important, um, and there are several that I, that I find really key, um, but one of the most important is that the, the, the system that we have established, um, the framework, it really encourages a supportive environment for policy change. You know, it, it generates, um, you know, public support, which is really needed um, for those, you know, we help build coalitions, we give support to existing coalitions, we use the media to generate conversations around the importance of epidemic preparedness and keep it on the front page or the forefront of people's minds. And these are all activities that are supportive to policy leaders trying to make change because it builds support behind what they're trying to do. And that's critical. And that, you know, and that I think is what has led to our, to the success of that strategy thus far. Um, but one of the other most important things that we have learned is that sustained advocacy is truly needed. Um, we've had budget successes, you know, in, in the years that we were, were when it, starting from the beginning um, in Nigeria, but there's also threats to the funding that needed to be addressed along the way. Um, we did have a funding stream through the basic health care provision fund, but it got it became threatened by a different interpretation of regulations that would that apply to how it would be dispersed. And you know that has since been worked out, but that was an important activity to main, to be sure that that funding stream was secured and maintained. Um, one of the things that we haven't um, discussed very much either, and we touched on it, but the selection of the in-country partners and the civil society organizations, it's really important to, to work with strong organizations um, and organizations where you can, that are receptive to some of the ideas that, that we are offering that fit into their frameworks um, for advocacy success. And in that we have, we have you know, our three partners all have extraordinarily str extraordinary strengths in the fields that they work and incredible contacts as well. Um, and that is extremely important um, for, for our success because they, they know the right people, they have the right access and they can call on civil, other civil society organizations to join the effort and spread the word about the need for epidemic preparedness funding and have it fit into broader agendas that are already being discussed. I think those are the major things, but um, you know, I think each step of the planning process that Dr. Kafar has already covered and the identification of the policy need and working with government to support their efforts are the core uh, activities that have brought success in Nigeria. 
Thank you so much, Anne. There, there is a lot to learn from the success in Nigeria, and I'm so glad, you know, and we take pride um, in what you mentioned, Anne, that these campaigns that we run in countries are locally led and uh, supported by the Global Health Advocacy Incubator. And a lot of the success at the country level um, with our local partners, international partners, is because of the coordinated work that goes on at the country level in identifying priorities, in creating a shared vision, in um, having local advocates who can speak to the issues that the country faces eloquently, powerfully, um, and with passion. Um, and we have seen Dr. Priscilla and Dr. Gaffar here today, um, well representing those very advocates in the country, both in civil society and in government. Um, so as we approach the final 10 minutes of this webinar, I do want to pause and take questions from the audience. Um, thank you to our dear audience for engaging throughout the conversation. We see a lot of conversation in the chat room um, and we've um, taken a couple of questions that also came during the RSVP. So my first question um, will go to Dr. Gaffar. Dr. Gaffar, this is a question from France. Uh, Midasiru Bebu from the Nutrition Division wants to know what the difference is between advocacy and resource, between budget advocacy and resource mobilization. Dr. Kafar, please. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, so in terms of um, uh, uh, budget ad advocacy, I, I think it involves um, uh, a lot of um, advocacy work along the public financial uh, uh you know management uh, system it requires a very good understanding of the public financial management system who are uh, the institutions and actors that play the roles uh, what are the processes uh, involved so that uh, and then identification of um, uh, bottlenecks and challenges along the pfm and advocating to um, write uh, people so that you remove those uh, uh, bottlenecks so that that is what we do when we do uh, budget advocacy and this budget advocacy uh, is linked to resource mobilization because at times in most cases uh, the the hand point is um, uh, to mobilize additional resources but uh, budget advocacy does more than just mobilizing additional resources budget advocacy also look at the issue of uh, who is benefiting from mobilized resources who is um where is money going what is the efficiency of spending as well so it's just uh, it's beyond looking at uh, what is the additional uh, dollar additional naira that is mobilized in terms of a volume of our resources but it's look at it's, it involves uh, looking at um uh you know a stream of activities that are involved in um, mobilizing and ensuring there is more money for uh for epr as the case in point and uh, ensuring uh, uh efficiency of uh, utilization of resources and it involves uh, uh you know forming very strong coalition that we have seen uh to be able to look at the issues along the public financial uh, management why budget advocacy will lead to uh resource mobilization it, it does have uh, more than that there are other important uh, uh factors that are taken into consideration so over Dr. Gaffar, thank you for that eloquent response. I do have one more question for you um, related. How have you engaged young people in budget advocacy? Uh, and do you have any um, advice for uh, young people or organizations working with young people on what role they can play in budget advocacy? So thank you very much. Like I said earlier on, uh, the budget advocacy involves uh, building a very, very stronger coalition, which involves uh, a number of suicide organizations and coalitions as well. So in the budget advocacy that we, we, we actually did, uh, we involve um, some association of uh, young people. I remember, you know, a forum for uh, young people for universal coverage, for instance, they are part of the uh, advocacy work. And uh, it provided a very good opportunity for them to have a very good understanding of how uh, a system uh, works, you know, as a young person, if you are involved in advocacy, exposed at a very early uh, stage in terms of understanding how public financial management system work, uh, what are the bottlenecks, what are the issues and everything. Because in this part of the world, the problem that we have seen is that uh, a lot of our young people don't actually uh, understand the public financial management system and the policy environment. So at times they tend to be very, very unrealistic with regards to their demand uh, from the government. So bringing them on board, I think actually give them early exposure. And uh, I would like to encourage more uh, youth organization to be part of the, the process so that uh, their members will have the ne uh, necessary exposure um, uh, you know, early in life so that uh, they'll be able to uh, do more productive um, advocacy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gaffar. I would like to remind everybody of what Dr. Priscilla said a little while ago, 
global health security is everybody's business and young people are, are at the core um, of, of our communities, our societies, and, and very integral to this. Um, with this, I want to go finally to Dr. Ibekwe. Um, we have one final question. Um, this is from Natalie from the G4 Alliance in the US. Um, Dr. Ibekwe, how can this framework be leveraged to also encourage structural changes in intergovernmental funding for public health? Um, your perspectives there, please. So this is a very great um, framework and tool uh, that actually supports the intergovernmental funding, uh, given that uh, health security is uh, at the approach we have taken in NCDC, Nigeria Center for Disease Control, is that of one health approach, looking at health, you know, um, uh, human health uh, in its, and its links to animal health and the environment, you know, so even the, um, the way we have developed all our, uh, we have, uh, we do have a strategy for one health and even the, the, uh, the NAPS, the National Actions um, Plan for secure health security. So we need funding or with all these documents that have been developed to help us articulate what needs to happen and they are costed to help in the, uh, in the push for funding in all areas you know, that affect our health and the health security. And not only intergovernmental in terms of sectorial, but also at all levels of government, whether it's national, subnational, at the local level. Uh, just to say there are quite a few um, questions on the chat. If you want me to address them in a couple of minutes, I'm happy to help. Yes, please, Dr. Priscilla, if you have any closing thoughts or remarks you would like to make, we, I welcome that. Okay, so in closing, just I'll do that in a second to say, well, there are questions on the chat around Nigeria and the doctor's strike to say in the COVID response, we have pushed very strongly the issue around the health of healthcare workers. We have developed uh, infection pre uh, prevention control programs and trainings that have been well uh, uh, assessed by over 50,000 clinicians across the country. Not only that, we have also improved, uh, the government is having com, you know, com, um, discussions around improving health insurance for doctors. Uh, to, uh, to, and also for NCDC, we're very strong on uh, personal protective clothing, ensuring that those of right quality for the right place are used. Um, in, in, in rounding up, I'll say health security is everybody's business and it's important we continue to invest in this, both at the national level, the sub-national level and at the community, and to know that together we can do this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Priscilla Ibekwe. Um, together we can do this. I, I think that is the takeaway from this webinar. We are at time, and I know everyone is looking ahead to a very busy week at the General Assembly. I want to sincerely thank our distinguished panelists and our guests for joining us today. Please do keep an eye out for the recording of this event and a blog post recapping some of the highlights as well as answers to your questions coming to your inbox soon. Uh, please continue keeping this conversation going um, on social media. I. Uh, our hashtags are hashtag Angus 76, um, sorry, hashtag preventing epidemics budget framework. And um, you could also follow at incubator underscore GHAI. Thank you again. And thank you to our audience, our distinguished panelists, our speakers, and everybody who joined us today. Have a wonderful rest of the day or evening and look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. <laughs>